I want to follow up on Margaret's question sure. and we'll lead to this because I think Margaret's point, you have a client, so you are right. going to call longitudinally. You see what happened before, right. and you see the court, and then you right. follow. We're only seeing the court proceedings. Exactly. We're totally looking at it. And, you, and, you're not, and you're not going to be privy to the private conversation no. between no. the lawyers no. and no. lawyers. And we don't even know which court proceeding this is, right? Yeah, right. We right. You, is you this sentencing, have... or is this? That's yes, right. you, yes, she will know that. Yes, okay. she will know that. Okay. We're gonna to go to the um, you know, the Otis we'll talk later. So after Frank. Okay. So what happens is, so let's let's take a shoplifting case. So the kids at Briarwood Mall on Saturday afternoon. You know, he's there with his buddies. Um, you know, we just had this case. So there's a boy. He's 12. There's another boy. He's 13. There's another boy. I think he's 13. They go to the shopping mall. You know, mom's out, you know, drops them at the shopping mall, and then she goes runs her errands, and she's going to pick them up later. So the boys are in Macy's. You know, like they just, oh, these are, these, these are, these are cool sneakers, right? So the boys go into the dressing room, they put the sneakers on, and they walk out, <laughs> right? Smile, you're on candid camera, because you're always on cam camera, right, these days. So the kids get caught immediately. They get taken to the security office. The police are called. The police come. There's a police report. Kids are, you know, parents are called from, they come to the police station, they get the kids, and then three, four months later, there's a petition filed. So it, that's the first, you know, it takes months sometimes to get these petitions filed. We are sometimes having six or eight months before a petition gets filed. So the kid has, you had tobacco products in June, or, or in, uh, in January of 2016, and in September of 2016, we're filing a petition saying that you violated the law back there nine months ago. What's the first thing that you know about adolescents and kids? No connection. Like that, like the brain does not work that way. I'm being punished for something I did when? So, the first thing happens, prosecutor, only the prosecutor can file a delinquency petition. It has to be the prosecuting attorney's office. So they file the petition, and then there's an intake process at the court. The intake process is usually a preliminary hearing or a preliminary inquiry. Once in a while, when you have a kid who's really young, usually 10 or younger, and they're charged with something that's really minor, they will do a diversion at the court level. So the prosecutor can divert it. There is a diversion project sometimes. I think that comes and goes depending on where the money's coming from from that, because when they had it, and I don't think they have it that I know of right now. When they had that stream of funding, it was federal dollars that were coming in, and that dried up. So now there's no more, I don't think they have a diversion program in the prosecutor's office. And you see this in, in the police um, precincts as well. So sometimes the Ypsilanti police will have a diversion. So instead of even sending the case from the police to the prosecutor, they might say to the kid, if you go and do this class on shoplifting, you know, we won't even send this to the prosecutor's office. And the kid goes and spends, you know, Saturday afternoon learning about shoplifting and why it's bad and, and how to avoid doing it and whatever. And then they're done. And the police don't file. But usually the police get, you know, they take the report and then they send it to the prosecutor's office. And then the prosecutor's office makes a decision on whether to charge and what to charge. So they'll say, we're going to charge one count of shoplifting. Or we're going to count... So here's what they did, the three little boys, because they stole three pair of shoes. So Johnny, number one, gets stole shoplifting for his and conspiracy to commit shoplifting for the other two. Three, that, so that's right, three misdemeanors. Two of them are aiding and abetting, essentially, or conspiracy to commit. And, and they could be felonies. It's just possible. It's possible, yeah. yeah. <laughs> right? So they charge three instead of one. See, and this is what I, no other prosecutor's office that I've ever worked with would even, like, that would not occur to me, right? This prosecutor's office, is, it's three charges. So, so the, the prosecutor makes the decision, and then there's a preliminary hearing. Um, whenever the government charges anybody with a crime, adult or child, there's an initial proceeding to determine whether or not there's even enough evidence to make the defendant defend themselves, right? If the government can't muster enough evidence to show that there's some reason to believe that this person has committed this crime, then constitutionally, the Constitution says, you citizen, you don't have to stand trial for this. 
you can't be even hauled into court on this if there's not sufficient evidence to hold you. So there's this idea of a preliminary inquiry or a preliminary hearing. The inquiry is held when the child is not in custody. A preliminary hearing is held when the child is in custody. All right? So most of these uh, petitions... Uh, who determines whether the child is in custody or not? So the, the way that it works is, so let's suppose you have a kid who gets arrested today, right now. They, the police would call, you know, if it's a serious enough offense, usually unless it's serious, they're not going to do this. You know, if it's shoplifting, they're just going to call the kid's mom and dad, or, you know, and the kid will go home. Uh, if it's, let's, let's say, let's say it's the, the, remember the pizza case, right, the armed robbery. So the police get the kid from the armed robbery, the pizza delivery guy, the police call up, there's 24 hours a day, seven days a week, somebody from the juvenile courts on call to call and say, you know, I have Johnny Smith here, um, you know, he uh, had a toy gun and he robbed a pizza delivery man and, um, you know, that we're going to ask the prosecutor to charge him with an armed robbery. And the person at the court will say, we'll detain him. And then they go to the detention center, okay. pending the next hearing. So the preliminary inquiry is if the kid's not in custody. And remember, most of these petitions, shoplifting, it's going to take you months usually to get that through this whole process to even get it, the charge filed. Uh, you know, a lot of the stuff, it takes them weeks or months. Uh, preliminary hearing is when the kid's detained, and it has to happen within 24 hours of the detention. So if he's detained today, by tomorrow afternoon, there has to be a hearing before the referee, uh, and this would be referee Altenberg currently, to determine whether or not there's enough evidence to hold him on that charge or to keep, you know, proceeding with the charge. The standard, and they forget this, they being both the prosecutor and the court, the standard, they will talk about probable cause. That's an adult standard, right? So if, if an adult is charged with a crime, they're at a preliminary hearing, a uh, preliminary examination, they have to show that there's probable cause to believe that there is a crime committed and that this individual committed that crime, right? So there's an armed robbery, we've got to show that there was an armed robbery, and we have to show that, you know, Mr. Jones committed that armed robbery, right? You have to have some evidence of that. That's not the case in juvenile court. In juvenile court, the standard is it's in the best interest of the child and it's in the best interest of the community to proceed with the charges. So my argument is, when was the last time it was ever in the best interest of a kid to be charged with a felony? <laughs> you can't authorize this. They ignore that. Um, and I think more and more it's not in the community's interest. Because what happens is, you know, there are all these collateral consequences. One of which, remember we talked, you can't get a job? But that's only one of them. There are thousands of collateral consequences. You can't get in the, you know, you, you can't get financial aid from the federal government if you commit convicted as a juvenile of certain things. You can't live in public housing. You can't receive uh, public benefits. You know, you can't get food stamps. Your family can be thrown out of their housing. A, a privately owned trailer park in the state of Michigan, if you're a juvenile and you commit any crime, your trailer park can come to you and say, you've got to move. You've got to take your family and get out of here. Yeah. So if we're talking about that group of um, uh, misbehaviors that the 18 that cause a, a, a child to be prosecuted as an adult. Right. Does that have any impact on the standard that needs to be shown at the preliminary hearing? It, it, if there's a, if the prosecutor, so let's assume uh, the armed robbery case, the kid's 15 years old. Instead of charging him in juvenile court, the prosecutor can say, I'm going to charge him in adult court, and then he's just an adult for all purposes. So if it happens, if we see it happening in the juvenile court, the they've charged them as a juvenile. That adult, the, the adult standard is not, does Co not apply. That's correct. So this business about being kicked out of a, where you're living and things like that, is there a time limit for that? I mean, once you, no. it's your, the rest of your life. The rest of your life, essentially. So there are, we did, the, the American Bar Association, probably four or five years ago, did this collateral consequences um, study. of, And we did that. Our, our clinic did that for the state of Michigan. And I was, I was appalled, because I didn't realize that. I mean, there are hundreds of collateral consequences to a juvenile adjudication. I mean, it runs the gamut. 
there is no part of a kid's life that could not be impacted uh, if, you know, if people know about this and, and want to enforce it. I mean, you lose housing, you lose financial aid. Uh, if you're convicted of any sort of possession or delivery of any sort of substances, marijuana, cocaine, heroin, the federal government will not loan you money to get an education. Where are you going to get an education? How are you going to fund that? Particularly if you're a poor kid, right? Um, private lenders do not have to lend money to you. They may, but they don't have to, right? So preliminary hearing. The court makes the decision, is this in the best interest of the kid? Is it in the best interest of the community? Um, I have never known this court in this county to ever deny a petition on that basis. They always say, and usually they make no findings at all. They just say, I'm authorizing the petition. They don't say, well, the legal standard is blah, blah, and here's my finding. And we have on a few occasions contested that to say, we don't think it's in this kid's interest to do this. Or we don't think it's in the community's interest to fit this kid up with a felony conviction. Because, the, you know, who's going to take care of this kid in five years when he can't get a job and he can't get into college? What's he going to do? How's that going to impact this community? We've never been successful at that. So the next step then is the petition gets authorized, and then there's a pretrial. So at pretrial, one of two things. You either plea or set it for trial. A trial, you might hurt, and they won't say trial, they'll say adjudication. Because remember, this is the land of euphemistic references. Um, a trial is an adjudication. So we're going to adjudicate the question of whether or not you're responsible for a delinquent act, not whether you're guilty of a crime. Plea. Uh, so you go to the prosecutor, the defense attorney, and the prosecutor talk, and they try to work it out, you know, some reasonable outcome. So there are two things. You can talk about the charges and what he's going to um, plead to, and you can talk about a little bit about disposition. So I mentioned that the court will defer disposition on minor offenses. So here's the kind of thing that the prosecutor will do, though. I don't want this kid on a deferred thing. I want to treat this kid tough. I'll charge him and say, well, I'll reduce the charges and he can plead, but contingent on him not asking and the court not granting deferred disposition. Right? So the prosecutor has no say in what the sentence is or what the disposition is. In adult court, you get a sentence. In juvenile court, you get a disposition, right? The pro that's not the prosecutor's purview. That's the court's business. The sentence belongs to the court, not the prosecutor. But the prosecutor will say, I won't reduce the charges and let him plead guilty to what he actually did if you ask for it. And even if the court comes up with the idea to defer him, I'll withdraw that, that, that plea offer. So essentially what they do is the prosecutors try to control the sentence by controlling the plea. That's, what, that's one of the schemes that this prosecutor's office. Again, 26 years, 20 prosecutor's offices over the years I've worked with, never, ever have I had a prosecutor's office do something like that. Every other prosecutor's office I've ever worked with is we do the plea, the court does the disposition, whatever they think is right, they think is right. This prosecutor's office gains it. So, you, you work out the plea, uh, and in Michigan, yeah? How, uh, how aware is the, is the court the judge of this process? They're very open about it, so they often know about it, almost always. In fact, we go to the court, we've gone to the bench, you will see them go up to the bench sometimes, and, and sometimes that's when, what you're doing, is you're saying, I would plead this kid to the misdemeanor charge, the lesser included misdemeanor charge, or dismiss, but the prosecutor will not allow me to ask for deferred disposition, so I can't do that. So I'm going to set it for a jury trial, and we'll come back in three months, and we'll have three or four more hearings, and there will be motions and craziness, and then they're going to reduce this charge, because they don't want to do a jury trial on this case. And then the judge will sometimes turn to them and say, are you crazy? Like, let's get this thing to solve. But, but, but I, I, you said that in the, in the cigarette case earlier. Yeah. But so if you, so the judge knows that it's happening in that one case. Is the judge aware that it's happening oh, yeah. they, more they, of a pattern? And, and if so, what can the judge do about it? They can't do anything about it. 
The prosecutor has the sole and exclusive discretion about bringing the charge and resolving the charge. The court, if I, if I as a lawyer come to the court and say, you know, my, let's say the kid's charged with um, a felony of shoplifting, and I say, judge, my client would, is he's guilty of a misdemeanor shoplifting, and he would enter a plea right now. The judge can't take that plea. The judge, we can't do it. Because the prosecutor, the Constitution, right, this is a separation of powers question. The executive branch of government brings the charge and decides how to resolve the charge. The judicial branch of government imposes the penalty. So is it just that our prosecutor is way smarter than all the other ones in the other 20 counties that aren't smarter. doing that? I would say your prosecutor, our prosecutor is harsher than any prosecutor's office that I've ever worked with. The, I understand Oakland County plays some of these kinds of games. I've never worked in Oakland County. But it is, this prosecutor's office takes an extremely hard line. The gentleman here had, a, I thought you had a follow-up to your question earlier. You answered it with the separation of power. Okay. But I think that's where we're also looking for some support from our judges. Uh, and we've had a tiny bit of responses that uh, and I'm not quite clear when it's done, but that they have uh, then recommended um, either in one case it was a victim offender conferencing or I don't know what circle. the circle, yeah. And it's at that point, so some of the judges are starting to be aware that they could do that. They are having trouble, the prosecutor is not supportive of it, but they've gone ahead and done it in a few cases. Right. And I, I'm, they are also elected. Yes. <laughs> and so I, I, I wouldn't want to just say the judges have no power. I, I don't believe that. Uh, I mean, I... I they make the, the prosecutor makes this decision, but you're right. The, the, court, the court has a lot of power. Right. If they decide to wield it, and the judges are not unreasonable. I mean, the judges are stu you know the judges don't like this either. I mean, some of the judges speak openly about this prosecutor's office being very right. harsh. Sometimes I've heard the word mean. This is a mean prosecutor's office <laughs> used. But one of the I mean, I think the judges and sometimes in, in the correct cases. I mean, they they have an interest in seeing that their dockets move. They have an interest in seeing that, you know, they don't necessarily want, you know, they're not evil people. None of these people are evil people. They're doing their jobs. Or they, they, you know, they're doing what they believe their job is. And so I think the judges, again, sometimes they're much more reasonable. And sometimes they will turn to the prosecutor and say, you know, I think you're being unreasonable. I actually had a judge recently, the prosecutor's office was so unreasonable in the case, that Judge Alzai, and I want to give her credit for doing this, uh, in case she ever sees this videotape, Judge Alzai said, I am going to reconsider my decision to authorize this petition because the prosecutor's office is being so unreasonable. And we had a kid who was very seriously mentally ill. He had been in numerous psychiatric hospitals. And they still, they charged him with 11 crimes um, that all grew out of the fact that he got into this thing with his mom. He took his brother's cell phone and it escalated and there were physical confrontations and the police were called. And, and windows got broken, and furniture got broken, and police got called, and a police officer got... This kid is psychotic. I mean, he's seriously mentally ill. And, uh, you know, the prosecutor's office was just so unreasonable. The court already had jurisdiction from two previous cases. And the judge finally was so frustrated, she just said, I'm reconsidering my decision to authorize this petition, and I'm going to deny your request to authorize it. So, you know, good for her, good for Judge Outside for doing that. So the judge does have that power. The court makes this decision, that's right. And and so the court can say, I don't think it's in this kid's interest, and that's ultimately what the judge says. I don't think it's in his interest to try him on all these additional 11 felony yeah. charges when I've already got authority to do anything I need to do for this case. So really that arrow is not an automatic arrow over to that. There is a yes or no. You told us earlier it's almost yeah. always yes that, that the that's the right. hearing will go to the pretrial. 99.999. But there is a no. And there you just is gave us a no, one yes. example. Yeah. yeah. There is a no. That's that's a possibility. And I think Judge, you know, I think Judge Connors was probably a bit more willing to hear arguments. Um, not to say Judge Alzai isn't. Certainly he was Judge Connors was more willing to hear them than Judge Shelton, who was the previous judge. And I don't know enough about Judge Alzai yet. 
from having done enough cases in front of her to know what her perception is. But she did a fantastic job, I thought, in that case, ultimately saying to the prosecutor, your, being, your position's on these. But that's also taking a public defender that will actually take that kind of tact up to the bench, right? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, they'll, they'll, they'll push it to the wall, yeah. so to speak. He fought like crazy and filed motions and things and said, what ultimately, I think, convinced the judge to do it is that I talked to the public defender. I was the kid's guardian and litem and not his lawyer. But I filed a motion earlier to, un, you know, to basically ask the court to reconsider that decision to authorize the petition, and she denied the motion initially. Then the prosecutor, I said to the prosecutor, I said, "Yeah, this kid is seriously mentally ill." I'm well, not to the prosecutor, to the um, to the uh, defense attorney. Um, I said to the defense attorney, "The kid's seriously mentally ill. They had a there was a competency evaluation in the criminal responsibility of them. The psychologist came back and said." He's competent to stand trial, which I think is was correct. He is competent to stand trial. But I am really close. I mean, I think he's criminally responsible, but it is a very close question for me, and I really had to struggle with that. And so I said to the defender, I said, you know, you've got to act, because now I'm directing, because the uh, guardian of the essentially the court has said, this boy's mental health does not allow him to make decisions to direct his lawyer. So that's my job now. And I said to, him, to, the, pro to the defender, I want you to seek a second opinion on this question of criminal responsibility, which he's entitled to. And when they realized it was going to cost the court two or three thousand dollars for that evaluation, um, that's when the judge said, "Well, this is kind of got ridiculous." So, uh, plus it was pending for a year. Uh, you know, the kid was so mentally ill he could not stay in trial for a long time. I mean, he couldn't. He couldn't. He hit, it, it was part of his mental illness that he did not speak. He didn't say a word for months on end. I mean, he sat there for months. Um, you know, so I mean, he was a really damaged kid. Uh, so anyway, so that's the pretrial thing. So you get, you get, you plead it or you set it for trial. And if you set it for trial, then there are things like discovery. You know, it's never like it is on TV where there's some last-minute revelation that changes. The, you know, no witness gets up there and admits they're the one who committed the murder and not the person who's charged. That never happens in court, right? And the reason it never happens is because you've got this thing called discovery. So I get the police reports. I get all the names and, of the witnesses. Any evidence the prosecutors is going to uh, offer against my client, we have a right to see it. We get to test that evidence if, if it needs to be. Um, and, so, and so you set it for trial. The next stage in the process is that adjudication or that trial. Um, this is my hearing on board. I have a terrible hearing. Uh, so adjudication is the juvenile court word that means trial. Uh, and it's, again, your kid has a right to a trial before the referee, a judge sitting alone, or a judge and a jury. A uh, jury is six people. It has to be a unanimous verdict of guilty if the kid's going to be found guilty. Um, you know, you have the right to have your witnesses brought in. You have the right to have confront those witnesses. You know, it's just it's a trial. Who is the referee? Oh. Ju referee Altenberg. Uh, so she's just she's simply a lawyer who's hired by the court to fill a judicial role. So she makes a recommendation, and the judge reviews that recommendation. And then, assuming she signs off on it, Judge Outside signs off on that recommendation, it then becomes an order of the court. So for all intents and purposes, she's a judge. She has a little, technically, legally, a little less authority than a judge does. But for all intents and purposes, she's but a judge. She's not elected, right? She is not elected. That's and correct. how does she get that? Um, she's hired. She's a civil servant, so she's hired by the court to do that. You know, I'm assuming the judges, and I think every county handles it a little bit differently. But uh, I'm assuming that you know she goes through an interview process with the judges, and you know, usually they get people that they know. So it's I don't know what her you know, like some of them were in the prosecuting office, or some of them were attorneys working for the court, who the court hires to do that. Um, what percentage of cases go to these three different areas? Do most of them go to the referee? Half of them, and if so, what types? All, so all of them start in the referee, uh -huh. and then the the if it's set for trial, unless they waive the right to a bench trial, most of them will go to the judge for trial. Unless somebody says, you know, the defendant usually stands up and says, you know, we can have a referee trial, uh -huh. or you'll hear the referee ask, would you like that trial before me, before the judge, or before a jury? 
and you and you have to write. If you want a jury, you got to write that. You got to put that in writing and file. When we file our appearance, so a lawyer, when they're, when we're appointed to a case, we have to file a piece of paper saying, "I hereby appear on this person's behalf." We always file just as a matter of course a, a demand for a hearing for a judge and jury. So it starts with the referee, and it will stay with the referee unless if you, if you if you waive the bench. It could, and unless and if you don't ask for a jury, it stays with the referee. Right. So you so you you know you can have that decision. You can have that choice. And the prosecutor has that choice too. The prosecutor can say, look, we don't trust the referee. We want to go to the judge. I've <coughs> never known you to do that. Uh, my I, I've only done a, a couple of evidentiary hearings in front of Judge or uh, referee Alzai, or uh, referee Altenberg, and she has always been entirely fair. And so I mean, I'm very confident in the cases in front of her too. So I think she's really good. I think Judge Alzai is good. Uh, I, you know, the, I think the problem, if you will, in this court is that the prosecutor's office takes such harsh positions all the time. Perhaps this is a naive question, but are any of these people trained to deal with issues around children? I mean, the psychology of children, what to expect? That's an children? excellent question. It's not naive at all. Um, no, uh, you, no, I don't. You know, I don't know what training they get. There's no requirement for them to have. So you don't have to have any background in adolescent development to be a juvenile court judge. You don't have to know anything about child development or family functioning to be a juvenile court judge. Most judges, most lawyers, they don't go to law school to do this stuff. They go to law school to do, you know, business law or wills and trusts or whatever, right? Um, I went to law school to do this. I love this stuff. I guess you can kind of tell that. <laughs> I get worked up about it. But you know, like this is I always wanted to do this stuff. So I kind of, even though I have no formal training in child or adolescent development or family functioning, I mean, I know something about that only because I'm in the self-study. But there, most of the lawyers probably don't know anything. Um, so you have the adjudication. Assuming the kid is found guilty, if they're if, you know if they're found not guilty, that's the end of it. The case is dismissed. If they're found guilty, then there's a disposition, which is sentencing. Uh, which is a sentence in the adult court. So the disposition. So the disposition can range. Usually, most kids end up on probation. Um, occasionally, a kid will end up placed in either a public or a private facility, either in Michigan or outside of Michigan. So you may see some cases where kids have been sent to other states um, for placement, you know, in like Glen Mills School in Pennsylvania, or uh, there's a place in Nebraska, um, uh, what's the old movie, I can't think of the old movie. Uh, Boys Town. Boys Town, yeah, the Boys Town, yeah, the Boys Town. So there's, there is a place called Boys Town in Nebraska, it's a real place. Um, you know, there are a couple of places around the country where sometimes they'll send kids. Um, they have a couple treatment programs here in our detention facility. One of them is a drug and alcohol treatment program. There's a substance abuse program. And then there's a trauma treatment program for girls. So that's mostly girls who have been sexually abused. And, uh, you know, as a result of that, their behavior leads them into some sort of delinquent behavior. So those kids have... So there are two treatment programs here in, in the detention facility. The trauma treatment and the substance abuse and the drug court is over there. One of the, so most kids end up on probation. The court can do what's called warn and dismiss, which is basically give the kid a lecture. Don't ever come back here again. This is a bad thing you did. You know, walk the straight and narrow. I don't ever want to see you back here again. And that's the end of it. They can do that. I, I've never known them to do that in this county, and that rarely happens in any county. It, it's really a rare thing for that to happen. Uh, it has happened a few times. Um, but most kids end up on probation, usually three to six months probation, and, and they have to do things like um, go to school, mind your parents, stay out of trouble, don't commit any more crimes. If you've got drug or alcohol issues, Go to a substance abuse treatment uh, assessment and then treatment if you needed. Drug screen, you know, like urine drug screens. Occasionally a hair follicle drug screen. Um, you know, counseling, therapy, 
uh, is something that's sometimes ordered. So you know, it's 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 basically here's a list of rules. You know, sometimes they'll give the kid a, a curfew. More often than not, they say you know whatever your mom and dad say about curfew is your curfew. If you're not, a, you know, and I always tell kids you know like if you're you, it says you got to mind your parents. So if you know if mom tells you to take the garbage out and you don't do it, she can pick up the phone and call your probation officer and have you locked up. <laughs> so you know think about that when mom says. You know, and moms love to hear that because, you know, all of a sudden the room's going to get clean, the garbage is going to get taken out, the dishes are going to get done, you know, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, they, but they have a lot of authority. They can order them to do essentially anything that the kid needs. Mm -hmm. A couple of things to be aware of in terms of uh, what you're going to see in here. So, in this court, they're very focused on money. So, there are two statutory provisions that require that the court order fines or fees. So they have to order a crime victim's rights fee, and they have to order a state minimum fee. And the purpose of these fees is to pay for the, the state minimum fee. The idea is to help offset some of the costs of the legal system, right? So I think that's the $65 fee, if, I, if I'm thinking correctly. Uh, and the state mandatory minimum fee is waivable. Even Despite the name, the court can say, this family is so poor that we can waive that. And they, you know, they will do that with some frequency if it's asked for. But the defendant has to ask for it. The crime victim's rights fee is not waivable. It's $25 uh, is what they usually charge. And, the, and that, so there's a crime victim's rights fund at the state level. And that money goes to the state level. And then any crime victim can apply to have you know, get money to deal with whatever comes out of their victimization. So if, 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 a, if a person needs individual counseling or, you know, there's damage to your property, you can apply to the Crime Victims' Rights Fund to get some help with that. Uh, so that's what that money is for. This court imposes a $100 flat probation supervision fee. We actually have a case, we've challenged this, we have a case in front of the Michigan Court of Appeals right now because I think it's illegal. I think this fee is not provided for by law. The courts have repeatedly said, said that in the adult context that, so the court, the law says that the courts can, Im, can impose the actual costs of certain probation fees or certain probation things. Like if, if on probation you are required to take a urine test, they can charge you for that. Okay. Uh, so, but they can't, the, the Court of Appeals and the Michigan Supreme Court have both said you cannot impose flat fees because you can only order what is actual cost of these services. Uh, of certain of the services, not all the services, just certain of the services. Um, and so, here they do a flat fee, we've challenged that. The trial court has said no, it's an appropriate fee, and we've got that up before the Michigan Court of Appeals right now. So who knows when they'll get to it. It's been there for a year now. Um, that's not unusual. It usually takes a year or two for them to decide these cases. Yeah. I know, I, well, this one of our sons. Um, and I think he was 16. It's so long ago, and there were so many different things I don't remember at all. But he was before Judge Agar, who has was retired, and I think he's dead by now. Um, but he was sentenced to, I forget how long, two years maybe. Um, and the judge said he would, be, he would go to a camp because of his youth. And he actually went to uh, a maximum security prison. And when I went down to try to talk to the judge and say, so how come you set a camp and that's not where he is? I never was, up, was able to see him, but I was told that the judge has no say on where he goes. That's up the Department of Corrections. Um, fortunately, there was an actually good psychologist there, and four months later, he called and said, your son has no idea why he's here, what he did, what, you know, how this all happened, and he doesn't belong here, and if you can provide a really good structure over the summer, I'm going to get him out of here. 
And so we were able to do that. Um, I have no idea how it all happened. But I was just appalled that the judge could sit there and say where he was going to go when obviously there was no way he had. Right. So if the court commits, they, lose, they can make a recommendation. And, and I'm talking about the juvenile system now. If the, ju if the judge commits the kid to the Department of Human Services, she can make a recommendation about placement, but she doesn't control that. The Department of Human Services does. It, it's the same kind of thing in the adult system. The judge can make a recommendation to the Department of Corrections, but they ultimately make the decision. Um, again, right, separation of powers under the Constitution, judicial branch versus executive branch. Okay? Um, so the, the judge can make a recommendation uh, about placement, which is why, but that's why usually the court in this county will not commit to the Department of Human Services. You, the, the law allows the court either to keep the kid as a court ward under the court supervision or commit them to the Department of Human Services. So usually the court will keep the kid as a, a ward of the court and not make them what we call a PA 150 ward, which means commit them. Uh, they, the judge keeps that so that she can control placement. That, the good thing is she gets to control placement. The difficult thing from her perspective is you keep the kid, you, keep, you pay the bills. Right. So this, a lot of what happens in this stage of this thing, uh, in terms of kids who, who don't stay with their parents on probation, it, it really quickly becomes a funding fight. Who's paying for this? You know, the, the, the really mentally ill kid I was telling you about, you know, it was a battle royale to figure out who's going to pay for all of these mental health services. Is it the court, or is it the county, or is it the, you know, the county has a child care fund, or is it the community mental health? You know, so everybody's saying, You're, you, you pay, and they're, yo, you pay. And so, you know, you get, you get into these fights about them. I saw on the, on the one docket placement hearings in yeah. regard to juvenile court. Right. Do you speak just what? Yeah, it's a review there? hearing. So after the disposition, mm -hmm. there are certain required review hearings. So, the, you know, like the judge sends the kid off to the placement in, you know, Grand Rapids or Pennsylvania, and then they have to come back and say, how's the kid doing? Is he ready to come out and go home? Does he need more treatment? Does he need a different treatment placement? That kind of thing. So they have to review it. Are those reviewed at specific intervals, or how? The, yeah, there are some statutory requirements for that. Uh, it, it, it all depends. They're, they're different ones, so they have to be reviewed at least every six months. Sometimes the judge reviews them more quickly than that, and then certain times if the kids, these days because of remember the, the reformation, we can now keep kids until they're 21, but at 19 there has to be a hearing to determine whether you're going to extend that jurisdiction to 21. So there are some mandatory review kinds of hearings. The other thing at disposition that's really a problem in my view is uh, restitution. So restitution is, you know, the idea that you've got to make the victim of the crime whole, financially. And so that gets to be a, a challenge, right? Um, so an example, you know, we had a 16-year-old boy, broke up with his girlfriend, you know, had a little put his nose in a bottle of booze, got his mom's car, lost control of his mom's car while driving down the street, hit a building, $27,000 in restitution order. Okay. Like, how's a, how's a 16 year old kid who does not have a high school diploma and who is not on track to get one anytime soon uh, going to pay $27,000 in restitution? Okay. Um, tough case. Uh, other case, nine-year-old uh, boy, an autistic kid in a special education classroom, very, very uh, regimented. If his schedule is changed at all, he just cannot manage his behavior. He just loses it. Uh, they change his schedule. They say he can't go to the gym and play, you know, volleyball or whatever it is he was going to play. He loses control of himself, gets into a wrestling match with a paraprofessional in the school. She injures her shoulder. She has to have shoulder surgery. And she's off work for six months. 
nine-year-old boy charged $8,000 in restitution. We challenged that and said, the court just cannot order an eight-year-old to pay $9,000 in restitution. It's interesting. The prosecutor, they actually diverted him. So he's a pre-10 kid. So remember we talked about here the court has an intake process and a diversion. So they diverted him. But one of the things with diversion is you've got to take all your punishment including your restitution, and you can't challenge it. Well, this kid's mom came to us and said, he can't pay this. And so we challenged it. We said, look, you can't. You know, so we, the prosecutor, well, if he doesn't agree to it, we're going to charge him. And we're going to charge him, and we're going we're gonna, to, he's charged with a misdemeanor assault, we're going to make it a felony. Right? An eight-year-old boy. <laughs> like, why? Like, why are you so unreasonable about that? I mean, do you not get it that an eight-year-old boy cannot, or a nine-year-old boy cannot pay $8,000 in restitution? I mean, you don't get that? So, uh, you know, so ultimately the court made or ordered him to pay. And, um, you know, uh, he, but the court did let him back into the diversion program. The, the judge was reasonable in at least part of that. Um, so the, that's, that, Restitution is getting to be a real issue. And what you're, you, you may have just seen in the New York Times, and, and I don't think we're as bad as other states and, and other places on this, but you know, fees, fines, restitution is a huge problem for kids because they will keep them on probation. They want to keep kids on non-reporting probation. Well, you're still on probation. When you're on probation, you know what you give up? You give up lots of your liberty interests, right? The police can stop and um, pat you down any point in time, for no reason whatsoever, they can't do that to a regular citizen walking down the street. But if you're on probation, they can do that, right? If you're on probation and you skip a day of school, that's a violation of your probation. You can get locked up. So my goal is always to get kids off probation as quickly as possible. Um, and so, but they'll keep kids on probation to pay restitution and fines and that kind of thing. I was in court just the other day, and they had a kid who owed something on the order of $1,072.59 in fees, and he'd gotten arrested. He was 17, so he got arrested as an adult, but he still had this juvenile court case, and so the juvenile court, he, the, the, the reason he was, the adult court wanted to get him out of the county jail, because he's charged with a misdemeanor, and they don't hold people in the county jail if they don't have to, because that's expensive, right? But he's got this juvenile case, and the probation officer stands up and says, we want him to have a $1,075.59 you know, bond, and as soon as he pays that bond, we'll close his case. So he's being held in jail, in the county jail, for $1,000 in juvenile court costs. It's probably costing the county $2,000 a day to keep him there. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just silliness. Um, you know, so it's just, you know, that's the kind of thing that you'll see. Yeah. Are all of these um, boxes something that we might ostensibly see in court watching? In other words, do they all happen in public? Yes. Yep. These are public proceedings. So you'll see each of these depending on what time and what day you're there. And you know, like, I think all the prelims, for example, are held on a certain day and time, like Tuesday afternoon at 1.30 or something. Or at least usually they are. But you know, they have to be heard within 24 hours, right? So I think they're every afternoon at 1.30. Right, if the kid's the arrested. Yeah. But I think they have one day a week or one oh, afternoon yeah, where they do the out-of-custody ones. So you'll see kids show up for the first time. They don't have a lawyer. And, and they, the judge will say, do you want me to read the charges to you? And that kind of thing. All right? I've stayed way over my invitation. <laughs> I just have to say we're thrilled that you've stayed over. Yes, <laughs> and thank you very much. And uh, we hope that you will feel welcome to come to our monthly meetings. <laughs> because it's clear that we share a sense of mission. Yeah, I'm going to have to help if there's some way that I can help you. I have a question. I came in late and uh -huh. I apologize. But I have a question of how do we change? what? What, as citizens, do we do to change the way our prosecution works in this county? I listened to the man from St. Louis 
and he was wonderful. And he made, he was a prosecutor. Right. And he had a totally different right. view. How do we, as citizens, because we must have some power besides watching? And so it's a political process, right? He's, you elect the prosecutor. And he's and, been elected and, a long time. Right, and the prosecutor makes the policies for the office. So the, it's a political process, and that's how you impact it. We'll talk to you about what we thought about the background. Thank you. I know that there's some movement to try to find people to run against him. I, you know. Well, there is one. There's somebody running against him. I'm a write-in candidate. Yeah. yeah. Um, one of the things, thank you so much. Are you welcome. Um, seems to me that the clinics at the law school are doing a marvelous job. We're trying. Um, <laughs> I mean, Don Duquette is a member of our congregation, Kim Thomas, I know. We just elected Bridget McCormick to the Michigan Supreme Court, where she's actually making a guess from what we hear a big difference. Um, is there any way that you teach courses, or there are ways we could learn more about these processes in the law school? Um, not that I know of. I mean, they don't have any kind of adult education. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'd be happy to come back and talk more. Uh, I'm sure that Kim would come and talk. Kim knows more about the adult system. I'm sure people at the Innocence Clinic over there, you know, uh, Dave Moran or Imran, uh, uh, can't his last name right this second, um, you know, that they'd be happy to come and talk to you. They do innocence cases all over the state of Michigan. The other thing, one last thing I wanted to say is thank you because the attorneys who are coming out of your clinics probably are much more compassionate and knowledgeable about the things in, wrong with the justice system. That's really why we started this juvenile justice clinic is because we were, to give students a good experience in handling cases involving criminal case charges, but also because we hope that in one way or another that we can systemically impact things for kids, right? Um, the legal system, you, you know, there's a lot of people that get poor legal representation. And kids get the poorest of the poor. Um, and so, because they have no voice, they have no voice politically, they have no resources. Um, and you know, I, I, I get tired of sitting in court and watching really, really bad legal practice that has really negative impacts on kids and families. And so that's why, I, that was my motivation for starting this thing. I want to do something about that. I want to provide a role model for other lawyers about what I have. I want to train lawyers to do this stuff. And I want to challenge courts to do, be better at it. So that's why we started. So we hope that we're turning out a whole generation of lawyers that are going to do better. Yeah. Do you ever need any volunteers? Uh, maybe from time to time, yeah. You know, we do a bunch of lifer cases, and, and there might be some role there for volunteers. So if you want to go to prison and talk to people who are in prison for life without parole, uh, we might be able to find ways to. And you know, every once in a while, you know, mentorship is something. Particularly, like I was talking about earlier with the disproportionate representation of African American children, we need mentors, particularly men, hopefully African American men, white men if we can't get African American men. But we, we have a whole generation of African American boys who do not have men in their lives that are positive, you know, Role models. There's a great. There's a police officer in town here who used to be the, the officer, Officer Blair at the uh, Pioneer High School. He's a really great guy. I mean, he is amazing, and he is a real role model for kids. He's an African American guy, a police officer, and he he does these motivational talks for kids. and And we just need people to do, to take an interest in kids. Um, you know, so if that's something that you or other people would be interested in. We always are coming on kids who could use somebody to be a positive role model. Give a kid a job, you know, rake your leaves and give them ten bucks. And, you know, sometimes that's the best thing. You know, we, we try to set kids up. They have all these restitution and fees, you know, they don't have jobs. And nobody will give them a job a lot of times. So, you know, like, if we can connect them. When I was in high school, they had this job board at the high school that did that. You know, like some, Mrs. Smith needs her, her leaves raked. And if you want to rake leaves, you go rake Mrs. Le Smith's leaves. And, you know, she pays you 10 bucks or something. So, yeah. Do you have any sense of what's happening with the uh, uh, library for juveniles? There is a bill to uh, address some of the issues involving life without parole. Um, 
I don't think it's going to go anywhere anytime soon. Um, you, you may have recently seen that the, the New York Times actually editorialized about how harsh prosecutors are being on these life without parole. So the Supreme Court has said only a very small group of really uh, permanently incorrigible kids should be sentenced to life without parole. In Michigan, prosecutors recently had to file motions on all of these cases because of the new Supreme Court case. Um, and more than half of them are seeking life without parole. In some counties, every kid who's been sentenced, is, yeah. there has to be a re-sentence. Mm -hmm. So the, the long and the short of it is, um, in the short term, I don't see much happening. Um, I think it's going to be an issue and it's going to be litigated. We've got a case that's in front of the Michigan Supreme Court right now on a, a juvenile lifer case where we're arguing that the kid should have had a jury decide because it's an additional element of the crime to sentence them to life without parole. Um, and so sometime in the next year, we'll probably get an opinion from the Michigan Court of Appeals, or the Michigan Supreme Court. Yeah. So I, I have a question which uh, is a projection into the future. Uh, so say that the best of our dreams come true mm -hmm. and that uh, uh, restorative justice and peace circles prevail and that's how our uh, court system will operate in the future. Mm -hmm. But what in that scenario would be the role of lawyers, for example? Well, you know, my, I don't think that the charges are necessarily going to go away. Um, I think many of those things are going to happen when they happen at the back end of the system here. Uh, I think it, there may be some diversion, but there's, there's no shortage of cases. <laughs> you know? I mean, I've always told people my, you know, my career goal is to be put out of business. It would be great, right? I mean, wouldn't it be wonderful if we didn't need to have children who had lawyers? I mean, stop and think about that for a minute. If, if, I, if I could close my juvenile justice clinic, it'd make me the happiest guy in the world. You know, I'd move off to Vermont and write novels or something, right? <laughs> um, but I don't see that happening anytime soon. There's always going to be cases that don't fit that model. Um, there may be lots of it down at this end of the process or at the very beginning, but th believe me, there are no shortage of cases. There are hundreds and hundreds of cases filed in this county every year. I don't even, I, I can't remember, we looked uh, recently at how many were filed last year, and I, it was something like 450-ish, I think, uh, juvenile cases. That's not adult cases. You know, we'll go on and do adult work if we need it. But, um, it would be fantastic. But, but, but I'm thinking, business. would there be a retraining of lawyers to think differently? I mean, would law schools adopt different models? Would they, you know, think of restorative justice as part of the system? I think law schools do already. I don't think that's the issue. I mean, I think the issue is this, the actual governmental system doesn't think about that. But I mean, it's not an issue for law schools. I think most lawyers would welcome it that process. Most lawyers think that this that, that, that there's just a lot of absurdity in this system, like what gets filed and how it's handled. So yeah. um, earlier you gave some examples of the public defender attorneys who were acting unethically and not in the interest of the child. Yeah. And if we observe that as court watchers, um, what would be our method for reporting it and what if any um, thing happens to those defenders to ultimately get them Fired. I wonder what who hires and fires them. So there's an office here. So there's a there's a head of the office of the public defender. I think right now that there's an interim director, and I'm not sure. I think it may be Delphia Simpson. But you know, this again, this is a public service that your tax dollars are paying for. So my view of it is, it's the governmental operation. You have every right as a citizen or as a group of citizens to say, this is an office that we are paying for that is not doing its job. Properly. We want the county commission, we want the head of the defender's office to report to us what you're doing, why you're doing it, how you're doing it, and why you're not doing it better, differently, or more efficiently. Right? This is a public service. This is a taxpayer-funded thing. This is all political. So talk to the county commissions, complain about it. 
talk to the head of the, you know, send the head of the office. You know, I was sitting in court the other day, and your lawyers didn't seem to be doing the job. You know, why are your lawyers not fighting harder for these kids? I think you're entitled to an answer. That's a public, their salary is being paid by your taxes. And you, I think you got, you're entitled to an answer to that question, if that's your concern. I think we could go on with this for a lot longer, but I think you have something you need to get to, and yeah. I'd like to thank um, Frank for this. Thank you. Thank you.